Welcome to a Spirit of Debate. I'm Lauren Green. Christian persecution is growing around the world, but in Africa there's a more systemic problem. Not only are Christians suffering at the hands of terror groups like Boko Haram, but the continent's political dictatorships have, quote, deepened the culture of human rights violations. Those words from Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka, who leads the Diocese of Sokoto in northern Nigeria. It's the most heavily Muslim region of the country. And um, Bishop Kuka joins me right now. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you very much. Explain to us, what is the situation now like for Christians in Africa? Well, I guess it depends on the country, but I can only speak, um, let me say, a little bit authoritatively about the situation in Nigeria. Um, first of all, because of the nature of the political uh, system, the, the intensity of the corruption, the deprivation, the inefficiency in the provision of social services, um, these are the deeper issues. So they're really issues of governance. Mm -hmm. But spilling over is the whole question of you know, tensions arising from cultural differences, be they ethnicity or religion. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Nigeria, in the northern part of Nigeria, where Christians are by and large a minority, um, there are uh, tensions occasionally, you know, but not necessarily because Christians are in danger by just being in northern Nigeria. Mm -hmm. uh, but occasionally, you know, when there, are, when there are electoral failures or certain decisions well outside Nigeria, the burning of churches has always been, you know, and the attack on government, on, on church properties, mm -hmm. have always been a very common uh, sight in Nigeria. Do the, do, does the government look at Christians sort of as a scapegoat, as, you know, the, the Christians are the problems, or, you know, the Muslims, they say the Christians are the problems? Well, it's not necessarily because the Christians are the problems, because from Monday to, to, to you know, to Saturday, we all get on very well. Okay. Um, Christians and Muslims, people are in the market together, they're in the offices together, they're working together, they're in politics together. Uh, but occasionally things just go wrong. And I think that if you have a lower stratum of the Muslim community, especially in northern Nigeria, that for historical reasons have always tended to treat Christianity with suspicion, in part because um, they perceive Christianity to be part and parcel of the colonial heritage. Mm. And in northern Nigeria, there was a, a, an Islamic caliphate which existed for a clear 100 years before it was conquered by the British. So there is a feeling of historical, uh, in, you know, um, sense of injustice, so to say. And the, the, the result then is that um, when the Americans enter Afghanistan, for example, mm -hmm. or enter Libya, for example, uh, Christians take the flag. Uh, when you draw cartoons in Denmark, as it happened a few years ago, Christian churches get burnt. So a lot of these are largely knee-jerk reactions, but they are not unconnected with the fact that the governments have not done much to fully integrate Christians and Christianity you know, mm -hmm. you know, within the larger web of society, especially in northern Nigeria. Why have, not, why have they not integrated Christians into the community, um, like you say? Well, a, a lot of it, you know, leadership has to do with courage, you know, um, and I'm, if, if you, I mean, you in the United States will probably be in a much better position to understand the history of the civil rights movement uh, or the struggle against apartheid. You know, once you have a dominant group that assumes power, whether it's male or female or whether it's on the basis of religion or ethnicity, the challenge is to find those within that community that can stand out and say things cannot go on this way. So the problem with northern Nigeria is that the northern political elite have benefited and used Islam as a, as a, as a means of political mobilization. So there has always been the tendency to think that, you know, we need to protect ourselves and that we are in power to protect our religion. In the same way that, let's say in Rwanda, for example, the Hutus would have remained in power and there would be the illusion that mm -hmm. if you are Hutu, they are ruling on our behalf and it, it's in our own, own, own interest to support them. But what we're trying to do is to create greater cross-cutting cleavages within the political system. And they do exist. I think it's just a question of the lack of courage of the political elite, you know, to stand by some of the weakest members of, 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 of the society. I'd heard before that Boko Haram was basically kind of running through the areas of, of, of Africa, particularly in Nigeria, but that the government itself would just sort of look the other way or secretly support them. What, what is your take on that? I don't think any sensible government, even if it's a criminal government, <laughs> will be averse to peace. Um, a lot of, I think, Boko Haram took Nigeria totally unawares. You know, we have a military and a security, uh, you know, security agencies that have been quite corrupt themselves and also inefficient. 
Um, and Boko Haram simply, uh, uh, you know, exploited the institutional weaknesses, you know, in the Nigerian state. Um, it started out with quite a lot of confusion as to what exactly were they talking about. And if you, if you push back at the beginning, it was purely a question of issues of law and order. Then they began to attack police uh, uh, posts, you know, and, you know, dispossess the policemen of, of their weapons. And then the, the battle grew and grew. Then they began to attack churches. And people thought, you know, these guys were just against, against Christians. That narrative went on for some time until we discovered that mosques were also not being spared. And then yeah. before we knew what was happening, it was Boko Haram against everybody in Nigeria. And as I said, the lack of capacity of uh, those who govern Nigeria to understand the complexity of the yeah. issues. Do you know, this is what sustained Boko Haram. So what is the solution, if there is one? Obviously, it's got to be a long-term solution. Yes. Uh, well, short term is that, first of all, we are very, we're, you know, happily, uh, Boko Haram has co more or less been routed. And I think the new government in Nigeria has done extremely well. Again, the international community, the Americans, the Europeans have come in in a much more co cohesive manner than what we had in the last two or three years. Um, and that is why we are beginning to hear some good news about, you know, even the whereabouts of the, you know, of the, of the Chibo girls, for example. Um, the medium time is, is the reconstruction of Nigeria. There are presently over 1.9 or 2 million Nigerians that are away from their homes. You know, they are, they are, they are refugees across the country. Now, moving that huge number of people back to their homes, when it is quite possible that Boko Haram would have planted, you know, bombs and so on and so forth, nobody knows what the environment is going to be like. So people, getting people back to their farms, getting people's lives reconstructed is going to require quite a lot of energy and resources. All right. I want to thank you so much, Bishop Kuka from Nigeria. Thank you so much for being on thank the you, Laura. Debate. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And for more information, check out foxnews.com. I'm Lauren Green, and thanks for watching A Spirited Debate. Thank you.